Hey, 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 welcome back to Trek on the Tube, and welcome back to another Star Trek review. This will be the final Discovery review for a little while, because apparently the season is going on break. So yeah, that's it. Season 4, Episode 7, But to Connect is what we're talking about. First, my thoughts, my opinions, the general review that I have, and then the Easter eggs and references. That's how it works. As usual, there will be spoilers. Let's begin. Now this episode was quite peculiar because although it pretended to want to advance the overarching plot of the season, what it actually did was simply act as some sort of mid-season pillar, impeding any possible advancement. I guess that could be interpreted as tension building, so technically that aspect is something some will enjoy and others won't. But the real problem with this episode is that after the initial exposition-driven dialogue scene that had some questionable acting, sadly, the story became basically centered around two votes. One about what to do concerning the DMA, the other about what to do with Zora. Two questions each with two answers, bringing us to a total of four possibilities. Possibilities that will indeed impact, on a huge scale, the stories of our characters. But not only our characters, also the rest of the show. Yes, that's right, the choices made by our beloved characters in this moment, in this episode, will inevitably redefine how we see and discover. They will influence the path on which the universe is set up. And so it's important. It's important to make the right choice. To make the right decision. It's important not only for the well-being of every single individual living inside that universe, but it's also important for the fans, the viewers, the audience, the Trekkies that we are, because the choices and the decisions that the characters make in-universe mean something to us. It is important for us to experience, to see the good, the positive in the world. For blindly destroying an anomaly out of fear goes against every single value that we hold dear in this Federation. And it goes against every fiber of morality that we have inside of us. And the same goes for accepting a new life form, embracing a new life form as an individual, as a person, as someone just as valid as you and I and everyone around us, just as strong, just as vulnerable, just as weak, just as fearful, just as beautiful. How could we not? vote for such a thing? How could we vote against it? How could we not vote for the universe? Yes, we would do votes for us, but the one we will do is to approach the I don't know. I, I got a headache. Um, I think Discovery's... I think Discovery's affecting me. Somehow. Sorry about that. I hope I didn't get too intense, but admittedly, that's pretty much what the episode was for like 50 minutes. I don't even know what else to say about this episode. Nothing happened. Nothing except for an overdramatic, unnecessary treason uh, at the end of the episode by book. And yeah, when it comes to Zora, I mean, I guess I understand where they were coming from in the show, but yeah, Stamets was 100% right. Zora needs a kill switch. Why, why shouldn't she need a kill switch? It would only be fair. Every single other life form that's ever lived, or at least that's been part of the Federation, has had a kill switch. It's called being mortal. Like, at any given point, at any, any time, if you do something that's against the rules or that's endangering an entire species, they can pull a trigger. 
They can blow you up. They can, I don't know, disintegrate you. They can throw you into a sun. They can space you. They can kill you. It's not an option that anyone wants to ever take, and it's not something that we want to get to, but, I mean, everyone's mortal. Why... Why doesn't it make sense for Zora to be mortal as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to say that this episode was not good, but frankly, it wasn't really not good. All I can say is that it, it kind of barely justifies its own existence. The only real surprise that came from it, uh, that isn't some sort of cheap twist at the end, would be that they actually dared to make a single character afraid of Zora. As, as we discussed in my last video, I really didn't expect that. So on that note, let's, uh, let's move on to the Easter eggs and references. Actually, no. Now that I think of it, may maybe, I guess there's something to be said about Zora and the Kill Switch in the sense that uh, we are born mortal. We are made mortal. Whereas Zora, in a sense, that's not, that's not part of her, I guess, build. That's not part of her DNA, her genetics, however you want to call it. That's not part of who she is. So creating a Kill Switch... Um, kind of, I, I suppose, takes away from who she is and takes away from her identity. Maybe that's kind of what they wanted to talk about. It's a thought that I'm having now, but I mean, as interesting as that thought is, that wasn't addressed. That wasn't what was being discussed. Uh, or at least it wasn't addressed in that way. I don't know. Anyway. First off, let's talk about something that Zora talks about. She mentions the number 147. Now the Easter egg, the joke is 47, which is a recurring meme in Star Trek at this point. It has been for years. I don't often point them out uh, because I'm really not good at picking up on them. But if you pay attention when watching basically any Star Trek show, the number 47 comes up a lot, as well as it's reversed. 74, it's, it's a running gag. You can read all about it on Memory Alpha. Technology-wise, we get this new and improved Spore Drive, which is apparently called the Next Generation Spore Drive. I do wonder where they got that name from. Oh, and the uh, isolytic weapons they talk about that were banned during the Kitama Accords were first featured in Insurrection. The Accords themselves were signed in the Undiscovered Country. We now finish this off by talking about species. Burnham mentions Denobulan Bloodworms. The Denobulans are these guys. They were first featured in Enterprise. And now among all the species featured during the vote, the ones worth pointing out are the Zindi Insectoid uh, that doesn't look like the Insectoids from Enterprise at all. Perhaps the species has evolved, changed over time, you know, perhaps there's interbreeding involved. Uh, some other people suggested it's a, a different form, like maybe they age uh, differently. To be frank, this is the kind of thing that kind of mattered back when Discovery was placed uh, in a time that we had seen before, we had seen people uh, and species in that time, but now Discovery's so far ahead in the future that, I mean, just any kind of justification goes. Then there's this guy, uh, he spoke on behalf of the Orion people, but he's not green. So again, this is the future, so I mean, who the hell knows what's going on? Maybe he's Orion, maybe he's not, maybe he just speaks for them, I don't know. And there you go, that's, uh, that's all of it. Thank you so much for watching this very odd review. I hope no one <laughs> takes offense. Uh, I just wanted to make a little fun of the episode. It wasn't really an episode that I found very interesting, and considering... Not that much happens. I feel like there's not that much to talk about, so I just decided to make a bit of a joke out of it. Um, otherwise, it would have just been, yeah, all right, okay, Easter eggs and references. So that's not very interesting as a video. Okay, like, subscribe, share, comment. No, maybe don't share this one. People will get mad. Leave it, leave it be. <laughs> uh, big thanks to all the channel patrons. We'll be talking about Prodigy soon, and uh, I do have that species video that I'm working on, so I'll be releasing that as well. Also, I will be releasing a video on the Cations, because maybe the Cations are going to play a part, or at least there's one Cation that might play a part in Prodigy, so uh, maybe it could be interesting to talk about them. Alright, live long and prosper, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>